All right, here we go. Sayari the Kid. Yeah. Welcome to Vlad TV. What's up, Vlad? Like, I've been seeing this name popping up for such a long time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you've been on the grind forever, I feel. Yeah, been a minute. I've been working hard for a minute. Yeah. I mean, it's dope to see someone, you know, that doesn't just pop up, you know, out of nowhere with, like, a, a viral song. Like, I could <laughs> yeah. see the work <laughs> yeah, a lot year of ground after work. year. A lot of groundwork. Yeah, man. So... You were originally born in the Bronx, but you moved to Atlanta. Yeah, born in the Bronx, moved to Atlanta. Okay, at nine years old. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, what I was, was it like growing up in Atlanta uh, during that time? Uh, in Atlanta, when I first got there, you know, I'm I'm just like a New York kid. My parents, both from Harlem, um, my older brother and sister from New York as well. So, um, it was I didn't understand the culture at first. I wasn't even doing music at the time. Like it wasn't like. My family wasn't didn't have a music background, so I was just out there winging it. Um, I adjusted real fast though, cause I was I was real social, so I got cool with all the cool kids. Whoever played sports and was clowning in class, um, it was it took a minute to get adapted to the to the music though. Um, I think the first people musically in the South that I kind of um, went towards was Outkast mm -hmm. and really. Three Six Mafia, they weren't <laughs> from that Atlanta, but just the South, like that feel, yeah. they was kind of like, before Dipset was what they were, like a movement and a sound sounding a certain way, and if you sound anything like that, you would be compared to that. Yeah. So I was huge fans of um, uh, Project Pat, you know, all of those guys early. Um, um, who else from the A? Yeah, Outkast, don't, don't was the first guys. Yeah, musically. Yeah, man. Musically. So what made you actually want to start rapping? Uh... My brother, well, my dad had like a, he had like a bunch of DJ equipment, but he never took it serious. Then he had a Yamaha keyboard, cheap ass keyboard. And my older brother, who I kind of looked up to, he um, he used to fuck around with it because he was a big fan of uh, Wu-Tang and RZA and just like everything that they did. So he had this Wu-Tang Forever album and he would just play in and out. I mean, he had, my brother had every Wu-Tang album, like from like, Killer Bees, The Swarm, Shah he even had Shaheen album. Like I, like some of the Wu Tang albums niggas weren't buying. Yeah. All Method Man shit, Jizza, everybody. Um so I, I would end up listening to that. Then my other cousin, he was listening to like um Big L. My cousin had came down from New York, he was getting in trouble, my mom was looking after him. And on the way to work, um, on the way to school, my brother was driving, I was in middle school, they used to um freestyle to my brother Beast that he was making on the Yamaha. Mm. And so I used to, it was a combination. I was hanging with niggas that could always like joke around in class, like kind of roast off the top of our head. So I had mixed with that, with the rapping, and I had learned how to play a little bit on the keyboard. That's how I learned how to produce, because we had that Yamaha keyboard. So that's really, that's why I started, but I wasn't taking it serious like that, because I didn't have nobody musically around me like that. My brother gave it up, my dad didn't take it serious, so um, I was trying to play basketball, but then later on, when basketball wasn't working, I just kind of took the music a little serious. Right now, you talked about initially when you started rapping that you were um, basically rapping about a life that wasn't really you. Yeah, I was. I was. Because I was listening to DMX, The Locks, Big Pun, Biggie, Jay-Z, Nas, um, uh, all of them, Eminem, like, them niggas was crazy. Like, <laughs> my deep. So, like, I'm listening to this shit as a kid, though. So, I, I was spending my time trying to emulate that. You know, just kind of um, studying their flows, their tone of voice, and not not really knowing what I was doing. Now, the good thing was I wasn't trying to be that in real life. I was always myself. I mean, I was always a hustler, and I ain't playing no shit, but I wasn't out there, you know, shooting and robbing niggas and selling bricks. That wasn't me. But, but you were rapping about it initially? Yeah, as a kid, yeah. <laughs> right. And then uh, I think my brother, <clears throat> after I was take, started to take a little serious, we had a Christmas. Like, it was like a, a, a couple-year period when my parents, they were not that financially stable. So for Christmas, we would do things like um, pick pick somebody's name out of a, a box or something like that. And like we would have to tell the, that person one thing we like about them and one thing we, we don't like about them. <laughs> or something that they, they can improve or change. And I think uh, um, my brother was like, he said something good. Then he was like, yeah, I want you to stop lying in your music. Fuck me all the way up. Because I had had like four or five notebooks or rhymes front to back. Nobody was doing that. Like front to back, just stacked out, and I memorized damn near every single one. And when he said that to me, it broke me down because I, I didn't, because no one said it to me. Well, another nigga, my my, uh, my bro June, who was real close to me, he said it to me. I dropped my mixtape, and everybody was giving me all this good feedback, and he pulled me to the side of LA Fitness and was like, "I don't like what you, how you lying in your shit, yo. I know you, you ain't doing this shit." And after that, 
I stopped. Then I was just extra specific in my music, like very detailed, line for line. Niggas like, damn, nigga, I just did this shit yesterday. Why would you put it in the song? And it was like, I started to do that, and that's what my music has been since. But a good thing about me was I, I absorb constructive criticism. I fiend for it because it's hard to get it from people that you know. It's easy now. You go on social media, and the only nigga that don't bump into you, they they give you their opinion all day because they ain't going to see you. But it's different when it's somebody that you love put you to the side and tell you what it is because they, they ain't really looking to just tell you all good news all the time. Yeah. So it helped me. I mean, because I think that hip-hop, the, the best hip-hop is rooted in, in honesty. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like when you look at all your favorite artists, they're not making up stories all the time. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. putting you in whatever world they really live in. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's why people get criticized for being fake yeah. so much in hip-hop because – yeah the realness is celebrated so much. And it's easy to get exposed now. Yeah. It's, so e it's so easy for your bullshit to not add up. You know, oh, you yeah. catch the little Bow Wow challenge, and then you're like, damn, like, nigga, you ain't no, you can't, you can't fuck around like back in the day. You got to really be on your shit, you know what I'm saying? Or yeah. somebody gonna do an interview with somewhere, or some footage gonna pop up in the elevator that you ain't know a camera was in there, and it's gonna come out, so you gotta be real. You might as well just be honest. You might as well do the B rabbit effect and talk about yourself in the battle, mm -hmm. so that once the other person says it, you already said it. And that's why I do it. So speaking of battling, you started out battling. Yeah, I used to. I used to battle. Yeah. Okay. I just called the competing though. I never wanted to be looked at no battle like as a battle rapper. I just felt like whoever was next to me rapping, I I was better than you know. Okay, because Atlanta isn't really known for that. Yeah, at all. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Not to say that Atlanta rappers are, are not as yeah. good as other areas, yeah. but it's like when you think of the best battle rappers, mm -hmm. you don't think of a lot of Atlanta dudes. You don't. You know, you think of yeah. New York, yeah. you think of LA. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, but you were actually, you started, like, what, I guess, calling in to, to 107.9 and Yeah, 107.9 on had Freestyle Friday with Coco Brother. Right. And uh, a homie of mine that I knew. He was. Um, he knew about it. I ain't. I ain't. I didn't know. I didn't know how he, how you could go up there and do it. So he was like, um, "Yo, if you really want to do this, because everybody knew me from high school, going forward, I had just never lost. Like anytime, you know how it is. Like your homies think you can. You think you nice, and then that other nigga homies think they nice. I had a battle in front of the school bus. Killed them in front of the school bus. <laughs> niggas was wild. And this is before like camera phones was out. Yeah. Um, so um, I had like you know about 20 battles just off camera that only my certain niggas would know about. And then so my homie had hit me, and he was like, look, go, um, just go up there. We go up there at an early time. You could audition downstairs, and then maybe you can go upstairs and do it. You know, and they, do, they did like 11 weeks, and then you, if you win straight, you can get retired. So um, we went up there, and I'm like, all right, man, keep in mind, I got all these books still in my head. You know what I'm saying? Just still memorized with ease. So I went up there and there was like 50 niggas outside trying to get upstairs. I'm like, bro, this shit, how is this gonna be possible? Like everybody wanna rap. It was a nigga outside, he was just pairing niggas up. Pairing me up with one nigga, towing the shred, pairing me up with another nigga. I had to rap it maybe against like six niggas. And the dude was like, yo, enough is enough. He going upstairs, I ended up getting up there and I won 11 weeks straight all okay. the way. Yeah, never okay. lost. Um, what year was this? Oof, I don't remember. It was it was a, my, whew, a while back, man. Okay. A while back. I don't remember the year. It was so long ago. I um but that right there made me kind of take rap serious. Cuz I didn't really take it serious until I was like, "Damn, I might really be better than a lot of people." I'm not saying I'm the best, but at that time I was like, "Damn, I can compete and I got the heart to do it without getting nervous under pressure." Cuz that shit was a lot of the toughest day was the first day cuz I had to beat everybody up downstairs and then go upstairs with stuff that nobody heard. Then I had to go downstairs, we could curse, but then on air, I couldn't curse. Right. So I had to wing it off, off my head. And so it was like, that was the toughest shit I ever had to do. And then the feedback over the phone and just the way that my side of town was just like, damn bro, I'm proud of you. I never had had that. It wasn't no social media back then like that. So right. I had, it wasn't even on MySpace. You know, I, I, think, I think MySpace was lit, I don't remember, but. After I heard that, I said, you know what? I told my parents, I'm like, I ain't fucking with college. I ain't doing school. Oh, okay. I mean, were you enrolled at the time or? Uh, I think I was, I think I had enrolled. I think it was, cause it was the summertime. I had enrolled into some colleges cause I didn't get a scholarship. So I had enrolled and I, I just like, fuck it. I ain't going to school. Okay. You know I mean? How'd your parents had, take that? Huh? How'd your parents take that? 
Uh, be honest. <clears throat> I mean, you know, because that's just just to be to yeah. be fair. Yeah. That is essentially every parent's worst nightmare. Yeah. That their yeah, child yeah. is telling them <laughs> that they are dropping out of college to be a rapper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, good thing about my parents is they supported pretty much anything that we did that yeah. wasn't illegal. Okay. Um, they didn't understand it at first. Like, like, um. They were like, all right, well, you know, what you going to do? You know, what's your backup plan? My dad kept saying, you know, what's your plan five years from now? Um, but I always had to keep in mind, you know, my parents were working regular jobs. You know what I'm saying? They never had the opportunity or took the chance or whatever um, to really pursue their They had three kids, you know, got married. Um, so it was only so much that I was going to actually apply from what they were saying. You know, I had to take my own risk as a man. So, um they, they wasn't really against it, but I'm not going to, but they, everybody supported me. Like my, my family totally, when I needed something, a booth built out in my closet or whatever, my dad did it. So I can't say that he wasn't with it because he was. You know, my mama, anything that I needed, she did it. My brother bought me my MPC 2000 XL, first beat machine I ever had when, before it was all the software shit. So my family completely supported. I locked my room, myself in the room. My mom would tell you for like two years straight, literally every day, every night, like, knocked the walls off till I learned, and I made about 500 terrible beats <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> that the worst rapper on earth wouldn't use right now. So, yeah, um, yeah it was tough, it was tough. So you battled Ines at one point? Yeah, yeah, I battled Ines, shot the Ines, I fought with Ness. What kind of battle was this? This was at, uh, it was in Atlanta. I beat Ines in a battle uh, in Atlanta with MC War. It was a battle league in Atlanta called MC War. Okay. Motherfucker still owe me some money for that battle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I would never, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do no business with them again. No. Okay, so where was the battle rap scene at this point? It was because there when was I no did the smack. battle. Yeah, I uh, mean, no, no, no. What, what I'm saying is, yeah, when you battled Ines, was yeah. there a battle rap scene? Were there like known battle rappers at the time, or was it in just, Atlanta? Just period. Yeah, yeah, it, it was. Yeah, at, at that time, like, um, how, like, how little Don. All, all the smack shit was already going on. Okay. It was way past. It was way past all that. Okay, so. Yeah. Why not pursue battle rap? Uh, I didn't like. I'm a huge fan of it. Like I, I kind of grew up watching like all the Smack DVDs, the Fight Clubs. Like you know what I mean. Um, I didn't like where it was going. Like you know, just I felt like the um, the the respect level for like the fights that were going on. Like you know, one thing I liked about Fight Club was they put a table between the, the rappers because they don't respect each other's space. Yeah. And. Uh, I just like watching it from a distance, and I just felt like financially, this there, there comes it comes to a you know a halt because you end up battling everybody, and there's only so much that you can possibly do, you know what I mean? And then a lot of these guys end up setting their prices so high that they can't even battle. Like um, I came up watching you know like Murder Mook. I was a fan of Murder Mook when he first started on Smack. Yeah. And now it's like damn, I I don't get to see him pair up with with motherfuckers because. You know, I, like I, I've been waiting to see Hollow the Don versus Murder Mook. This type of shit should have been happening, but now it's like he's a battle rapper, but he's not battling. And I don't. Yeah, yeah no, tough. I mean we were heavily into it. I mean we even had our own battle. We had the, the Killers Battle League. Yeah. That we you know we set up, and uh, you know me and Math Hoffa uh, mm. worked on that together. Okay, I fought, and, and, I fought with Math. And you know we were real deep into it, and it was like it didn't feel like it was going to go to the next level. Exactly. And, you know, yeah, exactly. and then when Shady Records came in and yeah. did the the Total Slaughter, I yep, guess. Yep. And people were waiting for something to happen after that. Yeah. And then nothing happened after nothing that. Happened. Yeah. It was like, okay, it kind of felt like it was going to be. Is that because Joe didn't perform how he should have? Because it would have been interesting if it would have been another guy that, that could do it. Because Joe is nice. Like, Joe Buttons could rap, but I don't think he was built for that style of battle rap. With Hollow, um, yeah, I mean Hollow's a beast. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't, but I mean, but that was for him to kind of study the culture yeah. and not just himself. Yeah, of no, how, I mean, how they rap now. Like I sat in for the the Cassidy disaster battle. Like I was yeah. there. The first or the second one? Well, both. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, we went to the first one. Yeah. It didn't happen. And then yeah. the second one was in a garage. <laughs> and it was like. That was probably one of my greatest hip hop moments. I yeah, know, yeah, like yeah, being yeah. in that circle yeah, yeah. with like two of the I best. I like how they did it on the second one like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was dope. But it was, yeah. once again, it was like Cassidy did it. It yeah. was considered the greatest thing ever. And yeah. then Cassidy's not battling anymore. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. no one wants to cut that check. Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why it's like I'm. I'm not into the the guys who set up the battles. I don't really. But you know, I'm I'm close friends with um Hollow the Don. That's my bro. Arsenal's my bro. Cortez, Math Hoffa, John John the Don. That's my nigga. So it's like I'm just a fan of it. I watch it from a distance, man, and just whenever it's time to compete, if it makes sense, I'm gonna do it. But I ain't gonna be stuck into that. Yep. So after that, you started working on your music. Yeah. You dropped like what? 20 mixtapes, I guess? <laughs> yeah, probably more. And it seemed like you were kind of hopping around from different producers and different artists and everything yeah. else like that. I yeah. mean, I guess Brian Michael Cox. Yeah. Uh, who else? Um, was it for uh, Timberland at one point? Yeah, I fought with Timberland. I, yeah. Like, I, like, I fucked with Mike Will, Sonny Digital, yeah. Metro, Southside, TM88. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Early. Everybody. Yeah. Like what exactly was happening as you were working with all these hit makers? Yeah. You know, and they they were fucking with you. Yeah. But it seemed like nothing was really bubbling over the top. Yeah. Um I made a lot of decisions on my own because I always felt like as a, even as I was dropping all that music, I was so busy trying to find the wave of what I was doing. I could I could do what I was doing, but I was trying to find the culture and and everything. Sometimes people get it misconstrued with, you know, saying hip hop and just because I rap and I got bars doesn't mean that I'm able to, you know, sonically do the music the way that the people want to hear it. You know what I'm saying? So, like, when I was cool with a lot of, like, Sonny, Sonny Digital when he first got on, or TM88 when we just called him Brewski. Um, Mike Will, we from the north side, from the same side of town, before everything really popped off like that. Um, but I was, like, you know, fucking with Slim Duncan and walking him and shit back when that sound kind of came out to what it was. And then as I got bigger, I started to find my sound. Um, I did a... Cause I was trying to help so many artists. That's another problem I had. I was just so busy trying to help niggas, you know, rap and do shit in the studio. I had a studio. I was a businessman before even being an artist. So I was just playing around with the artist shit. I never really took it fully serious. I just was trying to do, be one of them niggas with, you know, jack of all trades, which ain't always good. It's t you know, I had to focus on one thing. So I ended up starting to do, my first uh, big mixtape probably was soon, something out of nothing, the first one. And then I did the uh, Heartbreak Series shit for the ladies and shit like that. And I started to find my sound. So um, it just was about me finding my sound. I could have been on, I could have opened up on tours for niggas. I just wouldn't do it. I didn't like the way certain niggas moved. That was another thing for me. Like I was thinking about doing it and getting on with certain camps, but I had already had my own label and I had, a, I was already purchasing my own shit. I had my own business. I had, my, I had three studios. I had artists and it was just like, uh, I didn't like the way niggas moved. Niggas was beefing with niggas. They was showing up to the club, shoot out you know, fights with 50, 60 niggas with different crews were doing. And I was like, nah, I'm trying to come home to my family at night. And it, I just felt like it wasn't about the money to me. I was like, nah, I'm gonna figure it out my way. And that's really what it was, trying to figure it out on my own. Yeah. You know, because I didn't want to blame, I didn't want to be one of these niggas that, that ride the wave and then when shit don't go right, they blame the people that's lit for why I didn't succeed. Everything that I did was, was my fault, you know? Now, you're cool with Quentin Miller. Yeah, that's the bro, yeah. <laughs> did you see the interview we did with him? Okay, so so Meek Mill and, and the Dream Chaser crew basically ran into you at the Nike store and they and they just jumped you? And they tried to get me in front of paparazzi at first. It, like, they, like we kind of caught each other. I was getting out the Uber and we kind of caught each other. Uh, uh, and then he sent his man. He was like, yo, come come over here. Meek wants to talk to you. And I was just like, I don't want to go in front of paparazzi. Like, I don't want to do that. And so, like, you know, they just followed me in the Nike store, yeah, and just popped off in the Nike store. So, but, but I mean, I'm not, actually, you know, I'm not like, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a street nigga, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm a suburban kid. I'm from Gwinnett County. Like, I'm not, a, I'm not a violent person. So, like, I'm not out here to be the toughest nigga. So, yeah, you know what I'm saying? That's that's cool. That's like punching me is like punching Frank Ocean or like punching I Love Macone. You know what I'm saying? Like, what what kind of points are you getting off of that? You know what I'm saying? Like, it it. If that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. I'm one of the most peaceful, like nicest motherfuckers that you'll ever meet. Like I'm not a street nigga, so like you can have it. You can have the 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 tough title. I don't. That doesn't do anything for me. Yeah, I'm I'm sad that that happened to him like that. I mean, I don't know Meek and him like that. I, I never yeah. really met him like that personally. But Quentin is the fam. I mean, but even I mean, a lot of niggas from the hood, you know, like if it's a nigga that's like that, that's comfortable with who we. I, it'd be different if he was popping off like a street nigga and then he really was a quiet nigga, but Quentin don't do that. It's certain niggas, it's certain niggas in the hood that if you see that's like that, you don't touch him. You know what I mean? So 
I don't understand. I don't. I wasn't there. I don't, Quentin said it happened. Um, that's the fam. Yeah. I mean, I hated to hear it like that because I'm like, damn, my nigga, you hella respectful. You hella cool, quiet, calm, collective. Why would anybody? But I guess you know, with all the cameras out and what's going on today, that's what's popping. Yeah. I don't know. So there was a rumor that you were ghostwriting for Drake. <laughs> well, was it? Yeah. That had to be because I was cool with Quentin, maybe, huh? Possibly. Oh. Yeah, that don't, Any I don't. truth in it? No. None at all? No. Okay. But but Quentin was. Quentin was? Yeah. Doing what? Well, Quentin was ghostwriting for Drake. Are you asking or are you telling me? I'm telling you. Okay, okay. I mean, he's been pretty established at this point. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is not, we're not breaking any news here. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, what, um, what's a ghost, when you say ghostwriting, that means that he wrote something that he, the person's not admitting that he did. Right. And his name is on the credits, so, so that's not it's really writing. not ghostwriting. Okay, okay, there we go. Right. Okay. I mean, what's your take when it comes to to writing lyrics and uh, the collaborative process of, of writing lyrics? Because when you look at, for example, Kanye, yeah, he got like 50 writers on each of Absolutely. his albums. Uh -huh. You see what I'm saying? And yeah. people look at Kanye as one of the best yeah. ever. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? But yeah. then again, you look at like a Jay-Z who mm -hmm. never has anyone write for him. Yeah. You know, it's just his name yeah. on everything. Mm -hmm. Have you helped other people write? For sure. Okay. Has your name always been on the credits? Not always. Not always? No. Were you paid for the time that you you helped Not out? Not always. Not always? No. I made that mistake. A bunch okay. Of times. Well, because I guess on, on wire transfer, you even mentioned that Epic owes you some money for, for the Travis Scott album. <laughs> yeah, I did. What's that about? Verbatim. Exactly what you hear. <laughs> okay. So yeah. you you helped, I guess, write on Travis's album? Uh, yes, yeah. There's a got a record with Bryson Tiller called First Take. Okay. That my producers produced and then I did writing on. Okay. Right. And you never got paid? I haven't got paid yet. I'm going to get it. Okay. We got attorneys and, you know, we handle business and management for shit like that. Okay. They, maybe they're, they're just a little delayed on the process. Who knows? Who knows? It's a lot of labels doing that. Really? For sure. Oh, Labels, aren't paying. Hmm? Labels aren't paying. Labels aren't paying. They're maybe a little delayed. Delayed. Budgets get cut late. or No, I mean, listen, I used to be at SRC, which was part of Universal at the mm -hmm. time. Did they always pay on time? They, they did not always pay on time. But they did pay eventually. But that's it's like, I, yeah, you know, that, I had, some, I'm saying. I had yeah. some video guys come in and do some work and it took them like six months to get paid. Yeah, yeah. No, they I'm going to go, go, go get that. 